All attendees are in listen only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center and we're happy to welcome you to another one of our webinars in our Marine Protected Areas webinar series with EVM tools and open channels. Uh, we're really pleased today to have a, a very interesting topic a little bit outside the immediate scope of marine protected areas. This is more broadly about um, healthy oceans and the idea of a circular economy. So the title of today's webinar is Product Circularity and the Hidden Economic Opportunities of Discarded Fishing Nets and Ropes. And we have with us Martin Charter, who is the Director for the Center of Sustainable Design at the University of the Creative Arts in the UK. And I will introduce Martin in a moment. I'm just going to tell you briefly about the webinar. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the term, circular, circular economies aim to minimize resource inputs, emissions, and energy leakage by designing long-lasting products, maintaining, repairing, and reusing them, and recycling them at the end of their useful life. So we're going to be learning more about that, and particularly with respect to um, products that affect the ocean, uh, especially with respect to marine debris. Uh, so we will, as we usually do, have a presentation and then we will have an opportunity for questions and comments. So I encourage you to submit those through the webinar interface. And after we hear from Martin, we will have a, a dialogue with you and look forward to hearing your comments and questions. So Martin, welcome. Uh, Martin is the director, as I said, for the Center for Sustainable Design in the UK. Uh, he is a professor of innovation and sustainability at the University for the Creative Arts. And he has founded and directed the internationally recognized center of excellence focused on product sustainability and sustainable innovation, which has generated over 3 million pounds in income from research, training, consultancy, and events. So Martin has had extensive experience um, over 29 years in consulting on this topic. And uh, we're really pleased to welcome him here. And I will turn it over to you, Martin. Okay, uh, thank you very much to the team from the US in putting this event together and I'm uh, happy to be speaking. So what I'm going to do, I uh, really give a little bit of a, of a brief overview around circular economy developments. I'm then going to explore some sort of drivers that might start to provide opportunities at a local level for uh, more circular solutions and then the rest of the presentation really is going to focus on some findings from our Circular Ocean European funded project that's about uh, understanding all the issues to do with discarded fishing nets and ropes and then how we might create products and innovation in that area so uh, so thank you very much again so uh, you know the last couple of years we've had some sort of quite significant developments on the sustainability area. Uh, we've had the sustainable development goals uh, that's come forward, 17 goals, uh, really trying to bring in sustainability into focus uh, up to 2030. And a number of these goals have impact for the uh, you know ocean area and particularly number 14 there, but also a number of these goals also impact on uh, circular uh, economy. So really what we've had in the 2000s was perhaps uh, a focus around uh, and more visibility around climate change uh, and that culminated in the Paris Accord in uh, the late end of 2015 at a similar time to the Sustainable Development Goals. But perhaps the area where uh, we've seen uh, it may not be less uh, obvious is, is more concern post 2008 in terms of the, uh, you know, after the, the economic crash, if you like, around the whole issue of better use of resources. And so what we've seen is much more uh, activity emerging into the sort of 2010s in this area of, you know, moving away from the so-called linear economy, where we're sort of taking, making and disposing to landfill to this idea of the circular economy where we're retaining the value in the system through repair, recycling, etc. So, you know, what we're seeing is in, in Europe, the European Commission have produced an action plan 
China is producing a revised revision to their circular economy promotion law that they passed in 2008. And also we're seeing uh, quite long ranging plans and goals uh, in uh, the Netherlands uh, and um, Finland. So circular economy broadly you know, is a systems concept, if you like. So it's this idea of designing uh, uh, renewable, you know, uh, biologically uh, based products like clothing to go back into the ground. So we design a system where those closing products can be composted in a reasonable time period. For technical products like fishing nets and ropes that are primarily made of polymers now, the idea is how do we uh, extend the life of those uh, materials in, in various products in, 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 in different forms, um, you know, ranging from repair uh, right through to repurposing and, and, and even upcycling, which um, from our work within the first standard in the world on implementing circular economy in organizations is not defined in, in the law or uh, standards, yet we're seeing more organizations uh, start and entrepreneurs starting to upcycle, uh, change the, the uh, you know, add value back to waste and sell products. Anyway, that's another story, won't cover that today. So in, in, a, in a business context, what does this mean? I, uh, I, you know, Best example I have is, is not from a, an ocean related product, but hopefully there is um, some some sort of comparability here. Is you have a company, Philips, the uh, electronics company, they have an approach where they look at um, various environmental considerations into their product and design, and they've now developed a system where they're trying to design in circularity. So firstly, they're designing for maintenance and and repair, ease of maintenance, ease of repair. Then the next level is, you know, if the product is damaged, can it be taken back, refurbished and resold? If it's gone beyond that, can the parts be harvested and be reutilized in other products? And much further down the line uh, than, than perhaps we, we have thought in the past, uh, the sort of almost the final end um, of circularity as materials recycling and really right down the end now there is, is landfill so it's adding a, a more cascade of systems here so you know will the movement or the potential movement to more circularity or the transition to more circularity come top down or bottom up we've heard various initiatives here top top down but perhaps what we're seeing uh, again, it, uh, at a local level, uh, you know, is the emergence of various drivers that may empower um, more innovation at a local level. And this might be in the context of this uh, area, you know, reutilizing waste fishing nets and ro ro ropes or even broader ocean plastics, you know, thinking about things like port areas or coastal coastal zones. So. So this this is really a you know uh, a, a thought process where this is potentially more decentralised, more low carbon, and more circular. So what we're seeing is the advent of uh, a, a new group of makers, modifiers, and fixers. And uh, you know these are people wanting to make stuff, to modify stuff, or hack stuff. You know in the sense of product hacks, or fix stuff. And this has been driven by, you know, massive access to information. But importantly, you know, and it's still strange for me to think about this, uh, you know, video based information, YouTube and a number of these other technologies, Vimeo, et cetera, is still only sort of 10 years old. But we've had huge access to videos based information where we can see uh, people making modifying and fixing stuff so it may not be the best video in the world but people can actually get an idea of how how to how to do this more practically maybe so this is acting as a stimulus we've also got web point 2.0 uh, people sharing more more information on different ideas crowdsourcing uh, of ideas uh, linked into sort of more open approaches open innovation approaches and again, critically, before, you know, after 2008, we had the advent of crowdfunding. So what we have is the opportunity now to put crowdfunding campaigns together to raise money from, you know, interested investors direct. 
you don't have to go to the to the clearing banks so this is again uh, an interesting example it's a beehive developed by a father and son iterated the concept and effectively you can sort of tap honey directly from the beehive and uh, they put a crowdfunding campaign up and they raised uh, 3.2 million US dollars their problem was that was nearly 17,000 percent higher th than their goal but anyway the point here is that you don't necessarily have to have the click to go to the clearing bank if you've got a good idea what we're also seeing is people open sourcing the design of components and in another part of our activity we uh, we held an event and uh, a, an organization called Reading Hackerspace attended that event and they talked about an organization or individual who brought in a baby stroller uh, to that hackerspace uh, with a missing component. What they did was open source the component and use 3D printing to present the, print the component and the product was fixed and rolled out of the door. What we've also got is the advent of new places and spaces at a local level uh, to make, modify, and fix stuff. So these include fab labs, maker spaces, hacker spaces, and repair cafes. So what's different compared to 10 years ago is that people are coming together to collaborate and share ideas. 3D printing is evolving, both in terms of the use of you know, virgin uh, uh, plastics, metals, but now recycled plastics, uh, companies like Fillerbot, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, renewable or bioplastics uh, like PLA. Uh, also, local solutions are emerging where if you don't have a 3D printer, you can go out and identify people who have 3D printers. Also, what we've identified and then coming back, you know, and starting to hone back in on the, the topic today, is there's a whole series of new um, entrepreneurs developing uh, machines uh, to produce products from waste plastics. So the top left, you have Bifusion, who have a, a, an approach to produce uh, building products from the waste plastics. You have uh, a, a Royal College of Art in the UK a project called Polyfloss, where they effectively use the candy frost process to fluff up, if you like, um, waste plastics that might be used for things like insulation. Bottom right, you have Better Future Factory who are using 3D printing and a very interesting uh, project called Precious Plastics. It's a Dutch designer, Dave Hackens, who essentially has developed three machines to, to shred and in effect each injection mold. Uh, uh, waste plastics, what goes in the front is waste plastics like bottles and what comes out at the end is things like uh, litter baskets and other things through injection molding. We've actually literally today got an a, a great agreement to uh, of a new project to try and convert these machines to take uh, fishing net uh, and, and plastic ropes as an input and try and create products in the Brighton area in the southeast of England. So this should be a very interesting pro project. But essentially this is all part of this open sourcing, decentralization, more opportunities to make stuff still you know emerging but it is emerging now honing in on the topic um, the most well-known statistic out there is a, is a UN figure from about 2009 that talks about uh, waste fishing nets and ropes being approximately 10% of all uh, marine uh, plastic debris and from this uh, statistic this represents around about 640,000 tons of nets and ropes. The particular project we're involved in circular ocean that I'll explain a little bit later reckons that this is is not is an estimate but the, it, it is not um, as robust as it could be. It, it, the, this figure may be higher. So of course these, these waste nets and ropes are creating problems in sea lanes uh, you know, dis destroying wildlife, and and this coupled with things like the broader marine litter, microplastics is really moving up the, uh, the the public policy agenda, also into the retailers' agendas, and even uh, even manufacturers. I, I've seen that Hewlett Packard are going to do a webinar separately linked to ocean marine plastic. Well, that, that's sort of interesting how 
uh, almost lateral, uh, uh, you know, elements are starting to connect with this because of the, you know, broader challenges of that plastic ending up in the ocean. So what we found through our research in our circular ocean project is that, uh, you know, what we're seeing is, is of the, the main types of, there's been a big switch of fishing nets and ropes over the last, uh, you know, decades really from, uh, you know, a, a variety of materials into more polymer based materials. So what we're seeing is that uh, at, a, at a, a port level from our research, we don't see too much nylon because there's a market for that nylon. But with uh, polypropylene and polyethylene nets, there's often, you know, uh, piles of nets. Sometimes they stay there for a long time because there's no incentive to tackle the issue and there's no cost effective solutions to tackle the issue. So what we found in a European context is there's two major uh, recyclers of the fishing nets and ropes, the polymer fishing nets and ropes. One is called uh, Plastics Global and they're based in uh, Denmark. And they use mechanical recycling processes. They have arrangements to collect nets from ports throughout uh, Europe, but I also think they've also got collection schemes into Alaska now. The other interesting organization is a company called Aquafil, an Italian company who have effectively got a chemical recycling process that de and repolymerize the nylon fibers. They only tackle nylon into a second life and a third life fiber, etc. They claim is as good as new. This, this particular fiber is called Econile. So what we're seeing as part of this circular ocean project is, is a series of oppor business opportunities. What we're seeing <clears throat> is opportunities from a circularity point of view to extend the life of those nets, to extend the life of the products. And what we're finding, because the sheer value of some of these nets up to 250,000 euros in some instances, uh, that there's actually quite strong repair cultures in some of these ports to repair nets. Also, some fishing net manufacturers have take, take back schemes where they build in repair services. But there are, and also with an artisanal uh, fisherman, of course, they're, you know, they, they do repair, etc. themselves. We also see perhaps more lateral opportunities to uh, cut sections of the, the undamaged sections of some of these nets out and maybe create, you know, uh, golf nets, uh, football nets, uh, baseball nets, maybe to reutilize in terms of construction and other areas. What we also see is new companies starting to enter the logistics chain in the collection of, of, of the nets and ropes. Uh, and one particularly in Norway, who's, who really were first mover organization back in the late uh, 2000s called Norvia. Also I mentioned uh, fibers, uh, companies producing the fibers, uh, series of products, but also what we're finding is growing interest amongst various companies in converting some of those waste plastics into fuels. From an environmental perspective, maybe that's not so high on, you know, in the uh, prioritization, but for uh, fishing communities, maybe that are, that are, that are you know, uh, cost disadvantaged, if you like, maybe if they can't develop a higher value from that, that waste polymer, maybe this is an option. So we're seeing people making, uh, socks from utilizing fishing nets, uh, fishing net fibers, particularly the Econile fiber. Uh, however, you know, this is not the answer. You know, it's the direct, the, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, but what we're seeing again from a broader circularity point of view is these particular socks, they include cotton, they include elastomer, and they include the, uh, the, the second life uh, polymer fiber, nylon fiber. So that's good in one direction, and we're using, you know, a, a mix of, of we're reutilizing that waste material. But when, we, when this product comes to the end of life, we're going to have challenges with uh, the materials recycling there. So, you know, this is still a, 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 an emerging area. We also have celebrity surfers getting involved, uh, uh, or celebrities, including celebrity surfers, getting involved in this. This is a guy called Kelly Slater. Um, who has developed his own clothing range using uh, fibers from waste nets and ropes. And we're seeing quite a lot of sort of interest in some of that, you know, surfing community 
and, uh, you know, those types of networks in this area because they simply see this problem uh, or the problem of the, the nets and the ropes and the particularly the destruction of, of, of wildlife. So this is another company and I believe they also use an econile fiber. They produced, uh, they're called Fourth Element and they produce swimwear. A Spanish um, uh, uh, SME in the fashion business, they also using the nets and ropes into various uh, items. Klatermusen, this I believe is a Swedish company and they are they are producing backpacks. Uh, Adidas uh, have, uh, you know, a, few, a couple of years ago basically developed a, uh, a concept shoe using uh, gill nets. And at that stage, they w seem to be having a struggle to, uh, you know, move beyond the prototype. Very recently, they've announced they're going to produce a million shoes using uh, waste fishing nets. Um, but a question is, is this just waste fishing nets or is this ocean waste plastic or other types of uh, waste plastic? Um, because to produce a million shoes, you need access to those nets. So, so there's a little bit of uh, uncertainty, let's say, around, uh, you know, um, is this still an aspiration or is this reality? It's a big shift from a 10 to a million. Um, another interesting uh, example is uh, Interface Floor, one of the largest modular flooring companies in the world based in on your part of the, the, the pond in uh, 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 I think Atlanta in Georgia is where their head office is. Um, and, and essentially, they've developed a, a, a tiling product called Networks, where they're collecting um, the fibers in fishing communities in uh, Southeast Asia and in effectively working with Aquafil to, to develop a, 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 an eco Nile fiber from that that is then going back into the tiling products and sold. And perhaps a really interesting company. Uh, that is, I, I think it's registered in the US with uh, part of the organization based in Chile, is a company called Burio. Very much what I term in my broad life in sustainable innovation as a funky green company. They're a, uh, a bunch of guys, US trained engineers, one retrained in environment in Sweden, that basically want a good company, but sustainability is at the core of the business. The core business uh, was started as producing skateboards uh, from the waste fishing nets and ropes, uh, utilizing injection molding technology in, in their factory in Santiago in Chile. So they further branched out into sunglasses. They also now are producing frisbees linked to the Jack Johnson uh, music tour. They've now recently uh, launched a, a, uh, a fin for surfboards. Uh, using again the nets and ropes and also interestingly they're now producing components uh, for chairs, um, office chairs um, uh, and, and they, they claim that one chair equals 13.6 pounds of fishing nets so they're finding various applications for those waste fishing nets and ropes but also very interestingly going back to our overall sustainability picture and circular economy being one part of that broader um, sustainability picture is they've really got a so-called triple bottom line impact they they're also apart from the environmental and economic dimensions they are also uh, contributing money back into the communities that they're working with uh, to collect the nets and to clean the nets etc etc so they're investing back in those communities so what we're interested in, again within the circular ocean project also is what can be done at a local level in ports thinking about those drivers I mentioned could we construct innovation systems in those local areas to really change you know the mindset of, of, of that waste into material into products and perhaps what a, a, a sort of turning point might be a, a very interesting little company that's just crowdfunded uh, for £250,000 in Cornwall in the UK who've effectively developed a technology to 3D print using filaments from waste fishing nets. And they're called Fishy Filaments and they're a very interesting little company um, and, and what is interesting about that, it, that gives the opportunity to produce at the local level. 
So, you know, could we have bureaus set up in local port areas and collection facilities to, you know, granulate, to shred and granulate the, the polymers uh, and then 3D print various products from that. So that coupled with things like precious plastics starts to be an interesting little localized production system. So I've mentioned circular ocean a couple of times here, and uh, this is an EC funded project with partners. Uh, so the focus of the project is in the so-called northern periphery and Arctic region, and partners in and the project from Scotland, uh, Ireland, uh, Greenland, and Norway. We were uh, we're you know officially outside the region, but because of our expertise around eco innovation and circularity and working with SMEs. We were brought into the into the project so effectively there's a whole range of different outputs that we're producing this project from research around the ports what's going on in the ports in reality right through to life cycle analysis uh, conferences and we're particularly focused on the innovation and, and sme side so just give a couple of examples of some of the things that we've we've developed in the project what, I, what I've uh, run and set up is a series of product hacks where effectively we're working with a whole series of uh, creative uh, uh, creatives, whether they be master students in creative disciplines or entrepreneurs. Effectively, they're taken through a program and then they have waste nets delivered and they go off to workshops and they make products. So we've run this in the UK and Iceland and very effectively in, in the in the day you know because they are creatives they can make stuff so they don't just produce a plan they can make they make stuff so they produce a series of products uh, including lamps what we've done is to open source all these concepts onto a website and we're looking for people to co-design and co-develop these concepts to take them forward uh, ideally with the uh, with the, the teams that develop them. So that, you know, uh, more information can be provided on that if that's of interest. But also interestingly, one of the, the session I ran with the, the master students in the, in the UK, one lady got so interested, she developed a, a prototype pullover from, uh, from waste nets uh, for, uh, and ropes. So this is, you know, okay, it's not fully there, but you can see, you know, this is interesting and a, an interesting impact from that activity. So it's, you know, creativity plus waste equals product or product concept. Also, I was uh, external examining a sustainable product course in Mauritius, and I saw this very interesting little lamp that was produced there by a student. Very nice little, a uh, lot of fine work there. But it's not just on the product side, we're using some of the techniques that we've developed or I've developed over the last 20 years around sustainable innovation. A, a technical problem that is being faced in aquaculture is uh, that many of the aquaculture nets are, are coated with antifoulants that are mixed between copper, uh, greases and unknown uh, ingredients, uh, really to keep away pests and other uh, fouling agents. And this is a problem at end of life because under those antifoulants, there's very high quality nylon, which is a, uh, which there's a market. So basically, this is what you know some of these nets look like. So again, what I used is some of the creativity programs to try and tackle this process problem. And again, we work with teams of environmental chemists and other technical people to come up with a series of uh, uh, solutions to this technical challenge. And uh, these we came up with two solutions in the sessions and they, these will be open source on the website for people to experiment and take forward so that's going to be up on the circulation website and again I can provide information on that so really in closing you know um, we're looking at how we can convert you know this 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 issue of waste fishing nets. Remember, 640,000 tons of this nets and ropes are going to the sea. How we can set up better systems, and there is obviously policy implications for that, not just the innovation side. It seems to be without mixing metaphors, it feeding between you know falling between the net or the cracks. This area within environmental legislation around port and coastal areas, it's not being picked up as waste categories certainly in a European context from our research. So this is a waste. Um, there's not so many incentives. It seems uh, uh, it, it particularly outside of nylon nets to tackle this. 
but we're really looking at you know how can we create circular opportunities uh, or opportunities for more if you like circular products from those nets uh, and create jobs and products in local communities so thank you very much and i hope there was at least one idea that was of interest so to finish for the moment i look forward to questions all right thank you very much martin you gave us a lot of food for thought um and i <clears throat> encourage our listeners to please go ahead and send in your questions and comments i i see one or two right now but i want to make sure that uh that you all take part in this conversation uh, so uh, first of all maybe just a big picture question what do you see as some of the biggest challenges to doing this work in terms of trying to uh, generate products and scale them up so that they can make a real yeah. impact? So, I mean, I think some of the big, biggest challenges are the policy agenda. I think in a, in a supply side, what we've found and what we're doing is a piece of work really to try and identify all the products that have been made you know uh who are that are on the market aren't just concepts that are on the market they use utilizing waste nets and ropes and what we're finding is a lot of very small scale suppliers uh, uh you know one man and his metaphorically one man and his dog so um one you know in particular your point highlights a very live question that emerged from one of our our, our network uh, the uh, Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is a very interesting uh, network uh, dealing with these challenges, is there was a request through through their network from, I believe, a, a retailer who wanted to raise awareness of this issue among staff, and they were looking for uh, 100,000 bracelets that be, could be uh, worn as an awareness raising device among staff. Uh, you know, those bracelets being made from the nets and the ropes. But really, they were struggling with anybody that was was capable of making those uh, those bracelets, simply because a lot of the existing suppliers are just too small scale for that. So, you know, there's a capacity issue there. Um, so part of the challenge is raising awareness amongst um, people of those opportunities. And I think the other key issues is, are really associated with the uh, production uh, side to ensure uh, the, the quality of the recyclate. So again, I'm within Circular Ocean, I'm talking to one entrepreneur um, within Ireland, and he's looking to make a product um, from uh, the, the, the waste polymers, but he's having some challenge getting sufficient quality recyclate to, to make the product he wants to. So uh, policy is one level, uh, and, and, and capacity uh, and awareness is, I would say, uh, you know, issues, uh, you know, uh, at a local level. And we have some great examples that I will get to in a minute. But just before that, I want to follow up on a, an issue you raised. You started with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are, of course, very big picture policy drivers. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can describe either a, a key policy need in terms of helping uh, drive this circular economy forward or an example of a country that's doing this well that maybe could model some policy opportunities for other countries so um what i see and, and i'm a lot of this is coming into focus for me because i i'm actually completing a 34 chapter book around designing for a circular economy. So things have really come into focus for me. Circular economy, this idea of retaining value in the system to the highest level uh, is one part of the broader sustainability picture. Uh, circular economy does not equal sustainable development. However, some schools of thought seem to be trying to take that idea forward. Certainly that is not my perspective. It's one part of the broader set of issues what what we see is however circular economy touches on a series of the 17 goals particularly topics like responsible consumption and production so on a policy level what we're seeing is the european commission have developed their action plan and basically they um, publish this and then they are going to be uh, um, as far as I understand it, going to be announcing various developments at the end of this year. Perhaps something that, that, that's less 
people are less aware of outside of Europe is that already they're retrofitting some of the existing eco-design legislation that's been more focused on reducing energy in the use phase of products to bring in circularity. So uh, the commission are now working around materials efficiency aspects in a series of standards like uh, looking at pr product durability, remanufacturing, etc. So there's activity happening there. China, as I mentioned, published in 2008 a so-called circular economy promotion law. And uh, so they're recognizing this whole issue of in such a you know huge economy there, the issue of you know these sort of issues, and they're now going through a process of uh, restructuring that uh, within a sort of framework legislation. And I know that because I met some of the key guys a couple of weeks ago. Um, the countries that are really trying to push forward on circular economy in a policy level are the Netherlands, and they have a program going out to 2050, and also uh, Finland. Finland held a huge event about two or three months ago called the World Circular Economy Forum that I participated in. And this was like a thousand to fifteen hundred people from around the world coming together to discuss these issues. So Finland uh, are taking the issues out. The precise goals of both the Dutch and the Finnish are, are not so uh, specific yet, but it, it's an indicator uh, that, that they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, take this issue seriously. So watch the Dutch, uh, the Finnish, but also I'd say the Swedes. The Swedes, are, you know, have also announced they're producing tax breaks to try and stimulate repair by, I think, reducing VAT, value added tax on certain products. So they're, they're trying to tackle the price issue to try and stimulate repair. Sorry, I went on a little bit there, but hopefully that was interesting. Yeah, that's great. So I do want to get to some of our questions who came, that came in. A couple of them just saying thank you very much for pointing out this entrepreneurial activity and uh, really finding this very inspirational. And then we have a comment from Fran Recht, uh, who is noting that in the Pacific Northwest, in the US, the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission started a nylon gillnet recycling program, which is still going for many years in Alaska um, mm. and also in Washington and Oregon. And it is a private enterprise operation, but they need creative markets for this material. It usually ends up going to Asia for pelletization and molding. Yes, yes. No, very interesting. I did another webinar with colleagues in Alaska at a, at a uh, accelerator program in Alaska about a month or so ago. So that that's that's very interesting. So yes, it's key to try and engage the creative community and designers and entrepreneurs with this material and that, that let them loose on it. So one perhaps opportunity for uh, fishing communities that have maybe art and design colleges is really to give some of this material to those creatives and say, what could you do with this? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so here's a question from Wahini Surfwear, a startup for ocean-friendly surfwear. And they, she says, we are thinking about using econol textile, uh, if yep. that's correctly for the swimwear and she wants to know do you think that that's the most ocean friendly option the most ocean friendly option um it's a good question um uh, i would say uh econyl is the fiber that we are aware of that um is you know utilizing the nylon for fishing nets and ropes through the d and repolymerization process um they are producing this fiber on volume for various applications, including swimmer like Fourth Element and other uh, other other players out there, and into other other uh, products. Um, however, you know, I think objectively speaking, you know, chemical recycling of uh, of, of of polymers uses energy. Um, also. The chemical recycling process will have, you know, some form of waste unless they have some very innovative byproduct system. So I think it's a good. Um, uh, uh, it, it is a a source at the moment. I think if you're really going to be thinking about how to uh, 
you know, take this even further forward, it would be to try and use um, uh, uh, swimwear using the econile fiber that have some take back system where you could take the swimwear back uh, and perhaps uh, then use the, uh, um, you know, supply back to maybe uh, uh, aquafil and econal to then put those swimwear back into fiber again. So I think it's not just the fiber, it's what you do at the end of life. So it doesn't just become landfill in the second life, if you like, or the end of the first life. It's the next level of the thinking is how can we, you know, extend the life of the swimwear and it might be into entirely different products. So it might be into a surfboard. Um, but I would say the only other thing there is, of course, you've got other issues to do with then embedded carbon if you then send the, send the swimwear back to Italy. So again, it comes back to could you develop local uh, systems, you know, consumption and production systems. So we have a question here um, about net and cord manufacturers, the two kind of related questions. One is that net and cord manufacturers are the ones with the most experience in terms of nets handling and manufacturing at scale, as well as their contact with the fishing sector. And so the question is, are you involving them or you know, how could um, people work more with them on recyclability, repairability? And, and the related question is, is there research or work going on to make nets more environmentally uh, friendly in the first place? So um, it's a good question. Um, we within our project, some of the uh, our national partners have in our stakeholder research, they've uh, um, been collaborating with some net manufacturers. And some of those net manufacturers are, as far as we understand it, developing take back schemes whereby they will take back and repair nets or they'll provide a service to uh, fishing fleets to, if you like, repair and extend the life of the nets. Um, one of the, you know, uh, there are a range of new solutions that have been developed um, that uh, we came across, particularly in Iceland, where they're trying to totally re-envisage the idea of um, uh, the solutions to the catching of fish so they're not necessarily thinking about nets or they're thinking about using nets in a slightly uh, lower volume but also using sonar and other things to attract the um, fish into catching devices if you like so what we're doing and we'll be doing and we'll we're going to run this as a sort of global competition is to put out a series of challenges to come up with new solutions to this problem. Um, because of the nature of our project, those solutions have to be relevant to the so-called MPA region that I described earlier, but we're going to be looking for solutions from anywhere. So um, watch this space and, you know, there'll be a competition out there. We would welcome people's ideas. Yeah, great. And I, I, there's another question here from Ralph Rydell, who's, who's pointing out that, that waste nets are so widespread in the various oceans around the planet that, that it would be um, cost prohibitive as the only source for industry material if we're really trying to scale this up. So are there other sources that could be used? Um, right. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a question that's it's always a um, couple of issues here. Yes, yeah, about volume and recyclate to get a good um, continuity of volume to produce products. So perhaps around certain materials, there could be also uh, looking at other types of waste uh, plastics, such as bottles, whatever. But also one area that cropped up is is maybe also other volumes of the individual polymers, such as some of the polymers used for in agriculture, particularly if there's an agricultural link. So um, it's a good question. And just to, to, to bolt that one down, one of our within, uh, we're aware of at least what in one country, they were looking at the whole idea of developing a specialist mechanical recycling plant set. This is separate from Plastics Global, but the biggest problem they found 
in terms of making this feasible was the lack, lack of predictability of the of the waste nets uh, coming in and the types of those nets. So this 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 whole issue of volume and quality of materials it is a big issue. Uh, so a couple of ideas that you've raised are highlight the importance of connecting different types of groups who have different roles in this circular economy. And one of the questions from Sorcha Cantwell is, is there a network where we can link people who are recovering nets and ropes from the environment, such as myself, with companies or groups who would like to utilize them? We're not aware of any connector like that, but, uh, um, but maybe that's an opportunity for somebody, you know, who's got potentially access to the nets and perhaps access to, um, you know, entrepreneurs or creatives and, 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 and others. One interest, excuse me, one interesting example is a company uh, that, that we've collaborated with and we source the, uh, the waste nets and ropes for our hack in the UK. It was a company called MCBC Foods. And they're a company that effectively in the business of, uh, they work with fishermen, they, they effectively take fish and sell it into restaurants and catering. But they, as part of their mission and seeing the longer term, perhaps uh, more of a drive, not just for stewardship around, um, uh, you know, the source of, of, of seafood, etc. They started to see perhaps more policy challenges or, or customer challenges around the responsibility of dealing with the nets. So effectively, they're collecting nets. They're working with the recycler in Denmark to, to supply those nets. But they're also looking at opportunities to work with creatives and others to come up with products. But again, that's not their main business, but they're, they're trying to be responsible in this. So I would say if, if you, you know, there may be an, an opportunity to almost a network of nets, if you like. Or a network. Yes, indeed. A par appalling pun, but exactly correct. I had to do it. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> So uh, here's an interesting question, more on the citizen science side. Barbara Mayer is asking, if you have a school group or a citizen group that might be doing a beach cleanup, is yep. there a way that they can tell what kinds of materials these nets are made out of uh, so that they can help facilitate recycling? It's a good question. And uh, from our side, you know, identifying at a, at a beach combing or beach cleaning level of materials easily is not... Uh, uh, identifying the individual materials is not as easy as it appears. Um, there is, um, you know, we it seems to be there is expert knowledge. So one of the, 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 the tricks that certain people in the sector use is to, to use a, uh, a cigarette lighter and they burn a bit of the plastic and from the odor, they can tell what type of plastic it is. Uh, the only others, Main solution to that is, uh, I believe, handheld mass, mass spectrometry devices. But I, I think there's a certain amount of learnt knowledge there. So it, it's not so easy to identify the materials as one would hope, is, is, the, uh, is our uh, observation. And I, I must admit, I'm not a materials expert, expert, but that is what's being fed back to us. Yeah, and you mentioned aquaculture nets and how they yeah. have fouling ingredients. A related question is, uh, is there an effort to encourage nets to be made from one rather than multiple polymers to make them easier to reuse? It's a very good question. And uh, we I'm not aware of that at the moment. But, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'm not precisely aware of, of the extent of the mixing of polymers in nets. I'm sure there are certain types of nets that mix the polymers. Um, what we're finding on a general circularity point and, and the healthy uh, the, 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 the healthy sea socks is a good example even on a general level. Again, uh, the, those net those those socks are utilized, they've got a you know an elastomer, elastic 
uh, that, you know, that, you know, they've got a cotton in there and then they've got a second life polymer. So they're a mix of biological materials, if you like, with technical materials. The ideal solution from other work we're looking at within a, a center on uh, circularity and fashion, who we've got, uh, we're networking with, is um, the idea that that could you develop those socks using perhaps two types of materials, maybe the, the second life fiber from the nets, but also so-called cellulosics that use cellulose that could be at the end of life much more easily separated so that you had the, the polymer, you know, the nylon, and you had this cellulosic that you could reutilize in other forms. At the moment, you know, if you like, unzipping those three materials at the end of life is, is not easy. And, and I imagine unzipping different types of polymer at the end of life uh, may not be easy. But that's, again, part of the materials innovation going forward that one might want to see is could you develop different types of uh, products that have intelligent materials that maybe go through a process you know, heat or light or something, or even sound that could, you know, unzip the materials into separate material streams. But that, there's still some that that's that sort of work in progress as far as we understand it. But I'm, if people have got ideas or better information than me on them, I'm very happy to hear it. Yeah, and along those lines, Martin, we do have, um, you know, individual names and contacts we can share with you so you can see some of the detail and if you want to follow up with any of these folks. Sure, sure. We can, we can definitely make that connection. And as we always do, we will post a recording of this webinar on open channels so that you can share it with others who may have an interest in this as well. Sure, happy to do that. So, um, you know, we've talked some about uh, the idea of having these processes be locally based to cut down on transportation and, and other sort of uh, energy costs. And, and uh, that you gave the example of the 3D printer. And so one of the questions from Keith Wetmore, who's in Cape Town, he says he's buried in windblown waste that is collapsing. <laughs> yes. And he wants to know what kind of quality do you need to feed into a 3D printer? Uh, and can pre-sorting achieve this enough to be able to create um, usable products? It's again a good question. Uh, I don't have a precise answer to this, but I just suggest that, uh, that he hunts down fishy filaments because one video they produced was, was really surprising to me in that they, they claimed, and there was a physical video of this, of a, uh, a, a, it was almost like a, a, a doily, you know, I don't know if you call it a doily, you know, that you have like for cakes, like usually made out of paper, very thin, almost like a paper, paper lace type yeah. of thing. Yes. And they, they had made uh, almost a doily using a second life plastic that was very flexible, very thin. And I was really amazed by the, 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 the sort of um, fineness of that material. So I, I would just suggest, I, I don't know the, the infill, if you like, as to how they've got there, but there is definitely very interesting, these fishy filaments guys. And as I say, I think they watch that space because they've just raised 250,000 through crowdfunding to take their technology forward. And they may be perhaps interested in licensing, licensing the technology, uh, but I would suggest a, a follow up with those, those guys. Okay. Uh, Olga Sarna asks, do you have any advice on how to look for funding opportunities for projects aimed at utilizing nets and promoting circularity? She's mentioning that she's worked on a number of ghost net projects in the Baltic, but most of these projects focus on collecting the nets and then they're just stored and never used. And I think this just gets at the larger issue of working on marine debris where many of us are still stuck in the cleanup mode and we need to get make that sort of quantum leap into the circular economy and how do we make that start making that leap so i mean I, my only response in terms of the funding I'm, I'm obviously not aware of the u.s uh funding mechanisms but maybe there is some opportunities in terms of innovation or entrepreneurship type of type of funding uh but i i 
you know, in terms of the Baltic region, if there is an interest there, I suggest that they hunt down something called the Mar Marlet Project, M-A-R-L-E-T-T. -T. And this is a European funded project similar to our Circular Ocean project that is looking at cleanup of nets and ropes in the, the Baltic area. There similarly seems to be some interest from the uh, uh, I think the the the, uh, the German government in in this area as well, and I think you you guys are involved in some project uh, you know linked to that in some form as well that you may or may not be able to provide more information. And I will say, even though this webinar is hosted in the U.S., we are having a very international response in terms of the questions. So right. folks from all over are, are very interested in this topic, and along those lines. Um, Anur Ulan from Ireland said, you mentioned someone in Ireland who is working on these uh, fishnet recycling issues, and, and do you have a suggestion of an organization? Well, ba basically, dependent on where they're based in Ireland, uh, you know, they may be able to be eligible to be part of our Circular Ocean project. So I, I would suggest that they contact, go to the Circular Ocean project website, just put in Circular Ocean into Google, and then you, they, they hunt down an organization called Macroom E, Macroom hyphen E in Cork, and they are the Irish partner in the project. So they're, uh, you know, very uh, good and linked to various, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurial and other issues. So I'm sure that's probably your first port of call. Contact Julie Crowley uh, at Macroom E in, in Cork. Okay, great. Um, wow, I'm, I'm scrolling down and I'm just seeing there's so many questions here, um, which is which is great, <laughs> uh, including some comments uh, on your suggestion about uh, using a lighter to to <laughs> have kids sniff nets. Barbara, okay, I'm I'm not suggesting no, no, that no, anybody she, does that. I'm saying that that happens amongst some individuals. No, no, no. She said she promised that she won't have any kids sniffing burning nets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know if this is something your group is is involved in the issue of microfibers. I know we've there's a whole community focused just on that question, but is that something that you have been involved in in terms of the circular economy? So we decided when we started the project, we were aware of the sort of panel player of 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 issues around ocean marine plastics, and we decided because of limited uh, you know, budget and time to focus on the, the nets and the ropes. However, you know, in terms of microplastics, there's you know, growing uh, you know, awareness and issues around this, uh, you know, in terms of the microplastics in cosmetics and shampoos and uh, getting into through the, the water systems into the sea. And uh, what we're seeing here is uh, a number of companies starting to uh, ban the use of microplastics. So certainly in, in a European context and, and, and you know, specifically in the UK context, it's definitely going up the agenda. Uh, I'm not involved in, in the detail of it, but uh, as I say earlier, I'm seeing all sorts of companies now uh, that you wouldn't think would be, uh, uh, you know, attached to any of these issues, um, you know, um, doing seminars like, for example, the, I think, Director of Worldwide Sustainability for Hewitt Packard is going to be doing a webinar with others on ocean marine plastics. Wouldn't have thought Hewlett Packard would be naturally linked to the issue, but there's obviously some, uh, there's some links there somewhere. Right, of course. I mean, plastics has become such a big issue. We're all kind of coming at it from various perspectives. Uh, and just in terms of the connection to microplastics, Apparently, there are some uh, ropes and nets that are more prone to releasing microfibers than others, and it, such as uh, polyester and nylon, not, nylon six, excuse me, according to Stephen O'Reilly, who sent this question in. And just wondering if uh, if there is an effort to use um, different materials for uh, ropes and nets that are less likely to break down and uh, and create a fiber problem. I would say that that is um, 
going to be the next challenge because uh you know um I'm, I'm not full time on this area and I wouldn't claim to be an, an expert on it, but I've built some small amount of knowledge over a period of time. What I'm aware of that historically, obviously, a lot of the nets and ropes were not made out of uh, polymers, but there's been a big shift in the industry to make them. So we maybe start going to, to perhaps look, look back to see some of the old materials that used to be used. Um, you know, there may be a comeback of those different materials in a different form if we saw more prohibition on the on the perhaps more problematic nets. I would say, and again, I'm not an expert in this, I would say that maybe the nylon and nylon six is perhaps less of an issue. Um, it's it's merely maybe more the polypropylene and the polyethylene because the, the quality of those nets is uh, is is lower sometimes and also though as as far as i understand it to use for for bottom trawling and they get more torn and ripped so maybe that releases the fibers that that's just um you know some some thoughts there i don't take that as gospel but uh there, there's different qualities of nets and different qualities of nets may be more prone to disperse the fibers if you like when broken or torn right. or whatever so we need to wrap up. I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. I think this has been a really great discussion and obviously a lot of interest from all over. And I will just close by uh, noting a couple of comments that, that highlighted the importance of uh, this system-wide approach of connecting um, you know, fishing, uh, fishing communities and the producers of nets and lines and the creative community and the end users all in a um, in a network, as we said, mm. and, and how do we promote more of that systematic approach? So um, hopefully we can all work on that from our individual angles. And, and I just want to thank you so much for your comments. And I will let folks know that if we didn't get to your question, Martin has your contact information and can follow up with you. Thank you, Martin. OK, thanks very much. And have a good day, as they say on your side of the <laughs> Have a good evening. Okay. Bye.